God's still saving lives, amen? amen? And Jesus loves to save. We serve a God who loves to save. And I'm, I'm moved by that this morning in church as I'm singing these songs. Like, let's remember that God loves to save. He delights to save. And so last week, we get to celebrate that. And I, I would ask you, church, we clap, we celebrate that, but would you pray for these people and come alongside them as you know them to disciple them and, and love them and lead them in, even further into, into, the, into Jesus' way, okay? Let's do that together, yes? Good. Um, so today, uh, we're going to hear, we're going to kind of jump right in, um, but we're going to hear uh, about God's normative plan in communicating the gospel so that people can respond in saving faith, okay? So we're going to look at what Paul goes on to say in Romans chapter 10 about how God calls people to salvation. We've seen that God calls, that he elects, that he's going to justify and glorify those who are his, right? But how that process happens, how does one go from not having faith to having faith, from not believing to believing from being what was called unregenerate to being regenerate and converted to Jesus, right? That's what Paul is going to start to look at today for us. And so if you would turn to Romans chapter 10 in your Bibles, um, and if you don't have one, again, there's some up here, come get one or we'll throw one to you. And if you would just, let's stand in honor of God's word this morning. How many are so grateful for the living word of God? Amen. Like, I think we don't have to make this thing up for ourselves, Yeah. Praise the Lord for that. Oh, man. All right. Romans chapter 10. We're looking at 14 through 21 today, but we're going to take it uh, from 13. I want to read that again. It says this. For everyone, everybody say that with me. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Amen. Amen. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed what he has heard from us? So faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. But I ask, have they not heard? Indeed they have, for their voice has gone out to all the earth and their words to the ends of the world. But I ask, Did Israel not understand? First, Moses says, I will make you jealous of those who are not a nation. With a foolish nation, I will make you angry. And then Isaiah is so bold as to say, I have been found by those who did not seek me. And I have shown myself to those who did not ask for me. Praise the Lord, he did. But of Israel, he says, all day long, I have held out my hands to a disobedient and contrary people. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. Let's pray. Father, would you speak to us through your word today? God, I ask that we'd have eyes to see, ears to hear, and wills that would be obedient to the gospel. God, I pray that as we come in here today, you would raise up godly people who would take serious the call to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ so that the world may know that the Father has sent the Son, that the Son has saved. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen, Amen. church. You can be seated. All right. Oops, we're just throwing stuff all day today. It's just going to be that day. Um, So guys, this text clearly illustrates that God saves through means, okay? God saves through means. He has a method in which he often uses to save people. Paul, in explaining that Israel had rejected the gospel because they disobeyed the truth, articulates one of the clearest demonstrations of how 
one comes to saving faith in Christ. And what I want to call this is the normative path of conversion for those who believe. What we're going to see in this is the normative expression of a person going from death to life. That this is how God does this. He uses means. And it's extremely important, church. You know why? Because in dealing with the sovereignty of God, and if you've been with us for a number of weeks now, you know we've been sitting in this for a while. But in dealing with the sovereignty of God, some wrongfully conclude that if God has chosen to save some, then we don't need to evangelize because he's going to do it anyway. That if God's already chosen whom he's going to save, then what are we even here doing? That we can just do whatever we want, live however we want, live unto ourselves, and God will work out his plan anyway. Church, let me tell you something. That way of thinking is dead wrong. And it's Therefore, no surprise that in the middle of Paul's argument on the sovereignty of God, that he includes not only why people are saved, but the very means by which that leads them to their salvation. And so I want you to lean into this today with me, okay? You with me? Um, Because it's a precious text that we're going to look at and behold today. And, And further, listen to me carefully here too. I firmly believe that God is going to call up more preachers this morning. (laughs) That he's going to burden some of your hearts with a fire to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ so the dying world can hear and be saved. I believe that God in his sovereignty doesn't just speak this to us to go, hey, that's neat that we have a pastor, but because God wants to call up other pastors. And so today, I want you to lean in and listen deeply to the Lord. I want you to give him your yes before we even get going because the world is waiting for you to step in obedience to what God has for you and for them. And what I want to do to start is I actually want to flip the order of this text. You guys give me permission to do that today. All right? I want to, I want to start um, so we can finish on the means of salvation, but I, I want to unpack how Paul is vindicating God's sovereignty by explaining Israel's disobedience to the truth. He's explaining that Israel is responsible for their lack of belief, that they're the ones who have done this, and and we're going to see this here in this text. And so look with me here, verse 16. We'll get going right from there. So we're skipping a section. We'll come back, okay? You good? Verse 16. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. So pause right there. They have not all obeyed the gospel. Remember, Paul is writing to a Jewish and Gentile congregation, yes? And he's looking around, and these Jewish people are sitting there, and they're going like, yeah, my aunt and my mother and my father and my sisters and my brother, none of them follow Jesus, only me. Yes? So what's going on with that, right? Paul is arguing that Israel is responsible for their unbelief. Um, they failed to take advantage of the words God had spoken to them, pointing them to the Savior in Christ Jesus. And Paul equates that failure with their, their, their inability or their, their, actually their lack of obedience to the gospel. He says that they failed to understand, to see, and to believe, and therefore they have failed to obey the gospel. So church, obeying the gospel right here in this, in this verse is responding by faith in what the message of the gospel says. And do you remember from last week what the message of the gospel says? It says that Christ is both Lord, which means he is God, and that he has risen from the dead. Amen? Which is what we confess with our mouth. We confess that Jesus Christ is Lord and that God raised him from the dead. And you will hear in a minute Paul asking whether or not Israel heard the gospel because if they heard it, then they're responsible to believe it. And the answer that comes from the Old Testament states emphatically, yes, Israel has heard the good news of the gospel of the Messiah, Jesus. And so the first question Paul raises about Israel's disobedience to the gospel, their unbelief, is whether or not they've heard the gospel. Check this out. So verse 16 again. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. And then we have a four here. It's, it's stating why. What, what caused that? For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed what he has heard from us? So faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. But I ask, have they not heard? Indeed they have For their voice has gone out to all the earth and their words to the ends of the world. Church, notice in verse 16, Paul quotes Isaiah 53, verse 1, 
which says, Lord, who has believed what he has heard from us? Now, if you understand um, Hebrew poetry here in, in the prophetic writing, this is a negative statement. So it's saying, why haven't they believed what they've heard? What, what's going on here? And if you might know this, Isaiah 53 is one of the clearest prophetic images of the coming suffering Messiah, Jesus. And I would encourage you guys, go home if you haven't, read it and then read it again and study it out uh, because it's absolutely breathtaking the way that Christ fulfills everything that is said here. But it starts with this one question, who has believed what he has heard from us? Church, <clears throat> when Isaiah writes that, you understand that Isaiah is prophesying, yes? That he's foretelling something that is to come, Okay? He is prophetically declaring that there are many who will not believe what they have heard from the mouth of the Lord. Isaiah is prophesying the beginning of Isaiah 53 that Israel will fall into disbelief with the Messiah Jesus. It's a prophetic word. He's saying, watch this, because this is going to also be a sign. As you see these signs of the suffering servant, one of the signs is going to be that Israel is going to reject him. They're not going to believe. Do you recognize that? So verse 17 says that faith comes from hearing, okay? But specifically, hearing the message of Christ, he clarifies. His death and his resurrection. So faith comes when we hear the truth of Jesus, his death, his resurrection. We are moved to belief, moved to faith there, right? So if Israel does not have faith, it is simply that, uh, is it simply that they have not heard the gospel? That's the question, right? Well, they must not have got it. They must not have heard it, Yes? Look what he says. Verse 18. Indeed, they have heard the gospel. <clears throat> to back up that claim, Paul says they have heard the gospel. He's going to quote, or excuse me, Psalm 19.4, which declares that the word of the Lord has gone out into all the earth, that God has declared his truth to all um, so what's Paul's point there, church? Israel has heard the gospel. Not only did his prophets declare it beforehand, but God has revealed it through his creative work in the world. In fact, he quotes from Psalm 19.4, which declares the word of the Lord going out to all the earth through creation. And you remember, Paul's already touched on this back in Romans 1, Yes? Let me read this to you, Romans 1, 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness, say that with me, suppress the truth. Notice this. There's a changing that's happening. There's a warping that's happening here. Verse 19. For what can be known about God is plain to them. Because God has shown it to them. God has done this for all of humankind. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived, clearly perceived, ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. Church, Israel and the Gentiles alike are responsible for their own failure to believe because they refused the gospel, demonstrated through creation, and then given by special revelation through God and his word. They heard it and they rejected it. They saw it with their own eyes and they turned from it. Church, the creation clearly articulates God as creator. Amen? But Israel, according to Isaiah and Psalms, has rejected the word of the Lord from the creation and from the prophets. They have turned from it. They have hardened their hearts to it. Therefore, Israel, not God, in Paul's argument, is responsible for their disobedience to the truth. Israel is responsible because they were warned, they were foretold by creation and by the prophets, by God himself, what to expect in the coming Messiah, Jesus, and they didn't obey the truth. Do you see that? So the, then the next question that's logical in this thing is then if they heard the gospel but didn't obey it, then what happened? Right? Like why didn't they obey the gospel? Was it simply that it was unclear? They didn't understand it? God hit it? What is it? Let's look at this here, church. 
The second question Paul asks is whether or not they understood the gospel. Look what he says here, verse 19. But I ask, did Israel not understand? For Moses says, I will make you jealous of those who are not a nation. With a foolish nation, I will make you angry. And then Isaiah is so bold as to say, I have been found by those who did not seek me. And I have shown myself to those who did not ask for me. But of Israel, he says, all day long, I have held out my hands to a disobedient and contrary people. Church, what's Paul's answer to the question of whether or not Israel understood what they heard? He says, no, they understood it. They understood, they simply rejected the truth. Now, Paul begins by quoting Deuteronomy 32, 21, which states this, they have made me jealous with what is no God. God's talking here. They, that's Israel, have made me jealous with what is no God. They have provoked me to anger with their idols. So, notice the parallel here. I will make them jealous with those who are no people and I will provoke them to anger with a foolish nation. Church, Israel turned from God Almighty to worshiping idols, from worshiping Yahweh to worshiping no gods, these man-made idols. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie. Sound familiar? And because of this idolatry, because of their self-worship, God brought in another people, the Gentiles, those who would be viewed as a foolish nation to the Israelites, and I am so glad he did. If you don't come from Hebrew blood, <laughs> that's talking about you. Church, in Israel's rejection of God for that of idols, their rejection of truth meant they rejected the obedience of faith to God and God alone. They exchanged the truth of God, who he is, what he's worthy of, and they gave it to another. They rejected God. And as they rejected the exclusive worship of Yahweh, so they would reject Yahweh's anointed one, Jesus Christ. Guys, what's happening here is Moses is predicting a day when God would turn and bring in the nations because of Israel's rejection of his salvation in Jesus Christ. Now, that little thread Paul's going to unpack as we continue on here through Romans all the way through chapter 11. Um, <clears throat> but Paul furthers that point by quoting Isaiah 65, 1, which really, um, you'll, you'll love this, it's a taunt of God towards Israel. <laughs> you guys know there's humor in your Bible? Yes? God loves to point out irony through mockery sometimes, okay? Any of you guys do that? Take it easy, you're not God. <laughs> Very effective sometimes though, yes? Um, God is taunting Israel that due to the rejection of the truth about him, he would found, be found by a nation that never sought him. You catch that, that, that phrase there? If Israel will reject the word of the Lord, then God will reject Israel and give his salvation to another. That's what's happening here. And, and it's done so that when God gives his salvation to another, Israel might see that and recognize the error of their ways and go, man, what did we do there, right? So all those quotations are to reveal something about Israel, and that's this church. You notice every single one of those that are in there? This is what we read, and, you, and by the way, you're gonna, this is going to be like a Captain Obvious moment for you if you've studied the Old Testament at all. Israel is prone to disobeying the truth of God. I know that was like super profound. Yes. Israel, if we study this out, is prone to what? Not obedience, right? What is it? But to disobeying the truth of God. Israel throughout the Old Testament could often be deaf to the word of God. Some of the prophets define them and describe them as that. You're deaf. You've closed your hearing to the word of God. And what Paul is saying is not that they didn't hear or couldn't understand. Rather, it was that they wouldn't believe what God had made plain to them. They wouldn't respond to it. They wouldn't submit to the word of God. Israel is responsible because Israel hardened their hearts against the gospel of Jesus Christ. They heard it, they understood it, 
and they rejected it. And that's a sad state, isn't it, church? Paul's going to flesh that out for us a little bit more even as we unpack this throughout subsequent messages. But church, I don't want you to miss that. They heard it, they understood it, and they ultimately decided to reject it. Are you with me? May that be a somber warning to you so that you would not follow in their shoes. Church, I implore you this morning to not reject the gospel message you are hearing from the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to read you a Charles Spurgeon quote I read this week in my devotions that happened to be so fitting for this. This he gave on April 1st. The month of April is said to derive its name from the Latin verb aperio, which means to open, because all the buds and the blossoms are now opening, and we have arrived at the gates of the flowery season. That's true if you live anywhere else. (laughs) Apparently, even in London, that was the case, but not here. Reader... (laughs) If you are not yet saved, may your heart, in keeping with the universal awakening of nature, be opened to receive the Lord. Every blossoming flower warns you that it is time to seek the Lord. Do not be out of tune with nature, but let your heart bud and bloom with holy desires. If you tell me that the warm blood of youth leaps in your veins, that's if you're young, all right? How many of y'all are young in here today? Yeah, 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 okay, yeah, sure. (laughs) If it leaps in your veins, then I entreat you, give your vigor to the Lord. It was my unspeakable happiness to be called in early youth, and I am thankful to the Lord every day for that. Salvation is priceless, Let it come when it may, but oh, an early salvation has a double value in it. So young men and women, since you may die before you reach your prime, it is time to seek the Lord. Amen? So that's for you, young people. That's for me. Let's seek him now. We don't wait for later. We do it now. And you who feel the first signs of decay, show of hands. Carl Spurgeon is just the best, yes. I love this. Quicken your pace. That chest pain, that biopsy report are warnings that you must not trifle with. With you, it is definitely time to seek the Lord. I think he's grinning when he says that. I just... Then he asked this question. Did I observe a little gray, a little thinning in your hair? Years are flying by and death is drawing near by the day. Let each return, to, uh, return of spring arouse you to set your house in order. Dear reader, if you are now advanced in years, let me entreat and implore you to delay no longer. There is a day of grace for you now. So be thankful that the clock still ticks. Here in the silence of your room on this first night of another month, I speak to you as best I can by paper and ink and from my inmost soul as God's servant, I lay before you this warning, it is time to seek the Lord. Do not make light of this because it may be your last call from destruction, the final syllable from the lip of grace. Church, let me tell you again, Israel heard and they understood, but they did not obey. Don't let that be you today. Would you move to faith in Jesus Christ this very moment? Because today is the day of your salvation. 
We take for granted that we're going to have time after time after time that one day I'll get this whole thing figured out and I'll be able to say yes to that. But listen, today is the day. If the Lord is calling you, today is the day to say yes to him in Jesus' name. Call on his name and you will be saved. Amen? I'm I'm tempted to close right here, guys, to be honest with you. We'll come back to that at the end. You may be here and you've received this gospel message and I praise God for you. You you have responded in faith to the gospel. You haven't rejected it, but have fully embraced the gospel through faith in Christ's salvation. Praise God. You know what that means? It means that you're elect. It means that God chose you for salvation. And can we just praise God for that, church? Amen? Amen. He didn't have to save me, but he did. Wow. Wow. As I mentioned earlier, one of the criticisms of the doctrine of election is that it produces the frozen chosen. You guys have heard this before. Critics argue that if God has already decided who would be his, then why evangelize, why preach, why gather, right? Why would we do that if God's already chosen? That's the question. But if you're a believer in here today, then this message is for you. We preach the gospel Because God has elected not only people for salvation, but the means by which they will respond to the gospel. Amen? And so I want to start back at the beginning of this text, verse 13, where we skipped and and moved through this again. Verse 13, Paul's laying out this kind of normative path. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. I love how emphatically true that is. Everyone now, whether you're a Jew or a Gentile or a slave or a free or a male or a female, we're equal at the foot of the cross and salvation comes to us all through the same means. Amen? If you don't understand that, go back and listen to last week's message. The question now is, if that's true, and it is, everyone who calls on his name will be saved, then how will they know to call on Jesus' name for salvation? (laughs) And that's where Paul answers verse 14. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. How many of you guys, by show of hands, responded to faith in the gospel because someone else told you and preached the gospel to you? Show of hands, lift them up, hold them up. Look around the room. When I say normative means, I mean normative means. (laughs) This is normally the way this goes, right? We responded to the gospel because someone preached to us the gospel. Praise God for that person in your life right now, amen? Church, God saves the elect through means. God didn't just elect people for salvation and then call it quits. Yes? God elected the means by which human beings will respond to the message of salvation. Here's one thing that we get confused sometimes. Election isn't responseless. Are you with me? Some people say that, hey, if you're elect, they're just going to be saved. It doesn't matter what they do. They're just going to kind of continue on with their life, right? No, wrong. We see here in the gospel, we see here through Paul's writing on the sovereignty of God that there's a response by faith in calling on the name of the Lord. Church, Christians aren't willless, mindless, or thoughtless robots. Yes? Somebody like said, you just described my husband. No. (laughs) No, I didn't. It isn't that they have no will and therefore follow God outside of their rational thinking, church. In regeneration, God orients the will of the elect towards himself so they respond in faith to his gospel. God plants faith in their heart, something they can't manufacture. He puts belief in there so that they respond by calling on the name of the Lord. Christians respond to the gospel by faith and that faith compels them to call on the name of the Lord. And this happens because their wills have been transformed by the effectual call of God on their lives for belief in him unto salvation. Praise God for that. That he takes a will that is hell-bent on destruction and he turns it towards him. (laughs) And he says, this one, 
It's God's effectual call. What Paul is spelling out are the common means by which God saves a sinner. And so here's what those means are. I'm going to list them in reverse order as we kind of unpack them. Because you noticed, he said, how will they do this if this hasn't happened? But if that hasn't happened, this, 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 and this. And he builds it up. So I'm going to reverse it for you so we can start at the bottom and move up to calling the Lord. Yes? All right, here we go. Number one, a preacher must be sent. A preacher must be sent. Sent. Notice right away that preachers are sent by Jesus to the church. Okay? Um, when Jesus lamented over the shepherdless state of Israel, he said they were helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Like Israel had ran away from the Lord and deserted them. And then he said, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. And so every one of us goes like, let's go harvest, yes? But watch what Jesus says. He goes and commanded them to pray and the Lord would send out laborers into the harvest. Jesus said, so if there's no harvesters, you pray to God so God would raise up people to do exactly that. God is going to send them, church. And this is exactly what the Lord does. In Ephesians chapter four, we see that Christ gifts of the church with men who proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. And this is not a self-appointed task, guys but a God-given call to herald the scripture of Jesus. And because preachers like Paul are sent, you know what that means, church? We should pray that God continues to send more and more. Amen? Right now, we have preachers quitting more and more. We need to pray and ask the Lord of the harvest, the good shepherd, to send more preachers so more people can hear the gospel in Jesus' name. And so I'm praying that God would raise up even more gifted and anointed preachers from among this very house to proclaim the word of Jesus Christ. God sends a preacher. Number two, the sent preacher must preach the good news, which is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen? Church, preaching is heralding the word of God. So to herald the word of God is to announce it, is to proclaim it. Back in, in Paul's day, they would have heralds who would run from town to town to announce the edict of the ruling power above it and say, this is what he says, right? Heralds come out and we proclaim what you believe from deep within. Preaching is not simply articulating truth. It's not just, hey, I'm relaying facts to you. I want you to get this, right? or conveying the meaning of something. It's deeper than that. It has a deep motivating factor to it, guys. Preaching motivates transformation in the lives of the hearer because the one speaking it actually believes it. I have a verse handwritten in my study that I look at every single week as I begin to prepare a sermon for the weekend, and it says this from 2 Corinthians 2.17. For we are not, Paul writes, like so many, many out there, Peddlers of God's word, but as men of sincerity, as commissioned by God, in the sight of God, we speak in Christ. Church, a peddler is someone who sells cheap stuff they don't believe in. They're trying to get rich. They're trying to make money. They're trying to do this for them. Their motivation is wrong. They don't actually believe. But a preacher is one who's commissioned by God and isn't selling what he doesn't believe. He's proclaiming what he believes from the depth of his core. And let me tell you, that's what I do here, church. And I don't want an attaboy for that. I want you to hold me to that. And what a preacher must believe is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Notice Paul says that the message they must believe is the message of Christ. It's the good news of the gospel that must be believed for one to be saved. And so we preach the gospel of Jesus. Amen. Number three, the preached good news must be heard. So it can't just be preached into an empty room, yes? It's got to be heard. Here's what's fascinating about hearing the word of Christ. Uh, that phrase there in that verse. Scholars actually debate if this phrase means to hear about Christ or to hear Christ directly. And the way that it's worded in the Greek actually leaves the door open for both, both interpretations of that. Are you hearing about Christ or are you actually hearing Christ? I went back and forth and back and forth and back and forth and here's what I came down to, church. I think we can argue it's both. <laughs> Because for one to believe in Christ, they must first hear of Christ. I'm going to hear who he is, what he's done in his death and his resurrection. They must understand who he is. 
But more than that, I believe that as the gospel is preached, people soon realize that as they're listening to Christ's message, they are hearing Christ's voice. He is speaking to them through his word, amen? Jesus says, my sheep know me, they hear me, and they obey me. When we preach the word of God, we're hearing God. That's the powerful thing about expositional preaching, preaching the words of God, we're hearing God's word. And so this is the most powerful thing about the true gospel preaching is that when we preach the word of God, it is he who you hear, guys. Jesus tells us that we will hear his voice. In the Old Testament, in Deuteronomy, and in Psalms, and Isaiah, we learn that in hearing the word of God, we are hearing the voice of God, he says. As you hear me, you're hearing my voice. Scripture tells us this. So whichever way you translate that verse, A, you need to hear of Jesus, but B, you need to hear Jesus. So in powerful Christ-exalting preaching, we aren't hearing the mere words of an eloquent communicator When he preaches Christ through God's living word, we are hearing the voice of Jesus. That's profound. As he preaches the word. Number four, the heard good news must not only be heard, but it must also be believed. Yes? Um, Guys, it's not enough simply to hear Christ's voice in good preaching. One must actually believe it. Amen? Amen? Uh, faith, belief, comes by hearing, but hearing isn't a lot enough. We must commit to the truth that we're hearing. We must respond to that and believe it. Church, the Greek word translated believed here is the Greek word pistousisin. Say it with me. Pistousisin. I read that actually out of Greek, just so you know. Yeah, I know. Um, which has a deeper meaning than just believe. It actually has a sense, biblically, of this, trusting in Jesus, believe it or not. That word Paul uses means to trust in Jesus. For one to hear properly, it should produce in them trust in the one they are hearing. Not just, not just the word they're hearing, but in the one. So if they're hearing Christ, they must trust Christ. Agreed? So let me ask you today, as I asked you earlier, do you trust the one you're hearing? Have you been listening to the message without trusting the one who speaks it? And I'm not talking about me. I'm talking about Jesus. We need to respond to that today, church. Number five, finally. The belief must be the kind that calls on God for salvation. It responds. If you have heard the voice of Jesus through Christ-exalting preaching and you have trusted in Christ, it's time to call on the Lord to save. And so have you responded to the gospel in saving faith and belief? Ask yourself that. Wrestle with that. Because God uses preachers he sent to proclaim the truth of his gospel so that others would hear his voice and trust in Christ, which causes them to call on the name of the Lord and be saved. See the order there? God uses means. He uses others who are obedient to his truth to tell others about Jesus. And in so doing, they hear the voice of Jesus. Church, God ordained not only the salvation of those he's called, but he calls them through the means of other people. And these people are beautiful to God. Look what he closes with. How beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. Church, in Paul's day, people would wear leather-strapped sandals whenever they traveled. How many of you guys have a pair of Chacos? Come on, you can, you can confess now. It's all right. Um, I do, and I prefer to hike in my Chacos. So I've done this where I've hiked along, went through rivers and streams and this kind of thing. Um, what, what happens to feet when they hike in sandals? Anybody got an idea? Yeah, man, those things are stinky, they're dirty, and they're calloused, yes? Um, guys, listen, there was nothing literally beautiful about the feet of people in Paul's day, yes? I'd argue that's the same. I'm on myself on that one, all right. Um, but think of the scripture the feet 
of the ones sent to preach the word are beautiful to God. Yes, they're dirty, okay? But that's because they've walked a long way to tell somebody about Jesus. And yes, they're calloused, but that's because they've been doing it day after day after day. They've been going out and proclaiming the word of Jesus Christ, church. God doesn't see those feet as ugly and damaged. He sees them as carriers of the gospel to a dying world. And to God, that's beautiful, church. So I want to tell you a story of a missionary from West Africa. A certain man had elephantasis, which is a a painful condition that causes swelling in the limbs, especially the lower legs. So imagine your legs just becoming humongous, right? And through a missionary doctor, this man became a radiant Christ follower, responded to the gospel, believed in Jesus, and he loved to speak of Jesus. He wanted to proclaim that to all the world. And so painful as it was for him to walk, he went to every hut in his village to tell people what Christ had done for him on those feet. And when he finished, he went to nearby villages, walking several miles to each one on his bloated feet. And when he had canvassed every village nearby, he decided to visit yet another 10 miles away. And although his doctor forbade it, leaving early, he arrived around noon with feet bruised and bleeding. He spoke to the villagers all day and then headed home in the dark. And around midnight, the doctor heard a noise on his front porch. The man had arrived, barely conscious on bleeding, swollen feet. Elephantasis is always painful, but the travel made it far worse. Then as the doctor bent over to clean and dress the blood and bruises, his tears flowed. He said, my heart was so drawn to this man, I kept thinking, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. Who in here today is God calling into the proclamation of his word? Church, the life of the one with filthy, wounded feet in their pursuit of telling the world about Jesus is a beautiful life to God. And so I'm praying for men in here who would raise up and bruise their feet and live their lives for the sake of heralding the gospel that saved their souls. I'm praying God would raise up from this house people who would carry this message to the other side of the world and to this world right here. So change out feet for bank accounts. Change out feet for jobs. Change out feet for nations. How beautiful are those who are willing to be sent by Jesus to share his word, amen? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, in a world where pastors are stepping out of pulpits faster than we're filling them. I pray, Lord God, that you would raise up men of sincerity who are commissioned by God to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. God, I pray you would raise them up to announce the news of their Savior, Jesus Christ. pray you burden hearts right now for that. You send. Would you do this, Lord God? Father, I pray this morning for those who kept hearing this message to call on the name of the Lord. That now is the time, today is the day to respond to the gospel of Jesus Christ. calling on the name of the Lord. And so, Father, in this moment, I just pray over these hearts in this room who recognize that, that today's the day that you, God, are calling them to yourself. We believe, Jesus, that you are God and that you died for our sins and that you were buried 
because you bore the wrath of God that was due us, you took it on yourself. You bore it on that cross. You drank every last drop. And Jesus, we believe that by faith in your work, that that wrath was turned from us and onto you. And Jesus, more than that, we believe that you were raised from the dead. And God, in so doing, God's wrath was satisfied and his saving grace could be given to us, God, because of your victory over death so that, God, where we were dead in our trespasses and sins in which we once walked, God made us alive together with Christ Jesus. And so this morning, I pray for that in this room. I pray for men and I pray for women. I pray for children, God, that they would cross that line from death into life, that they would call on the name of the Lord and be saved in Jesus' name. So we praise you for that, Lord. If that's you today, I don't want you to escape. I want you to come talk to me. I want to see if God's doing this in your life. And so we have a little white card that says, I want to learn more about following Jesus. I want you to put your name on there, your phone number, and check that box for me so we can have a conversation to see if God is calling you to salvation. And so we can come alongside you and disciple you and help you grow in Jesus Christ. If last week you called the name of the Lord for salvation, I pray that you do that the same this week. You write that down so we can get with you and we can help you grow now and flourish in Jesus' name. So God, we love you. We worship you. We thank you that you're a God who saves. We preach that everywhere we go in Jesus' name. Amen.